Hello friends, enemies. We're gathered here today to remember the DC Extended Universe. In this video, we're going to remember the highs, the lows, the laughs, the slow motion, and we're going to hear from special guests like Emergency Awesome or Heavy Spoilers and a person? Yeah. Yeah, is this whole video going to be like really sad because this is a downer? You know what, Doug? You're right. So, to honor the abrupt tonal shifts of the DCEU, let's kick this funeral up a notch. It's the R.I.P. DCEU Funeral for a Friend Spectacular! Starring Emergency Awesome, Heavy Spoilers, Patrick H. Willems, The Real Rejects, Beatrice Arthur, The Screen Crush Staff, Doug, and many more. So guys, to celebrate the life of the DCEU and to mourn its passing, we are selling these special commemorative RIP DCEU t-shirts at our merch store, where we design the shirts ourselves at ScreenCrushMerch.com. This gorgeous cotton blend features a tombstone, with various heroes having left tributes to their fallen franchise. The link, if you will, is below. So the DCEU died young, and never really accomplished much. Just 10 years old, it's practically a child compared to some other Hollywood franchises. And how sad that it leaves us with a whimper, and not with a bank. The DCEU's final year has featured flops like The Flash, Blue Beetle, and the upcoming Aquaman sequel. And yet, could we not see this coming? The DCEU has led a troubled life. Unlike the MCU's Iron Man, the DCEU kicked things off with an uninspiring retelling of the Superman story that completely drained every ounce of hope and joy from the character. Now, if it sounds like I'm being harsh on the DCEU, EU, it's because, well, you know, here at Screen Crush, you know how much we love comics, and especially how much we support comic book creators. The movies that we like would not exist without the comics and the incredibly talented artists who bring these characters to life, like Mark Spears, who's our partner for this video. If you've read comics and you have likely seen his cover art on books like Spawn, Power Rangers, or on DC comics like Superman and Batman, Mark is known for these incredibly detailed paintings that bring these characters into the real world. But the work that I really love is his monsters. He reinvents classic movie monsters in a way that's gruesome and cinematic. Like, look at this Frankenstein. It's incredible. So, I'm very excited about his new creator-owned project called Monsters. It's set in the 1980s where two detectives are investigating these grisly murders. A retired monster slayer is drawn back into the life after an ancient vampire that they thought they killed returns, and there's also these kid adventures that give like a real Goonies vibe. The stories is like taking all of my favorite stories and combining them into one. Or like Stranger Things, but with much better monsters. Exactly. And now, Mark needs your help. He has a Kickstarter, links are below, to help make this project happen. Creator-owned comics are a very rare, special part of the industry. It's a chance for artists to unleash their true voices without corporate interference. So, if you like Mark's art and you want to see monsters happen, I highly encourage you to click the link below, watch the trailer on YouTube, and contribute whatever you can. For instance, here is $20. That's not how a Kickstarter works. I know, but like going on my phone doesn't look impressive on screen. So check out Mark's art, please donate to his Kickstarter, and thanks Mark for partnering with us for this video. Now back to Man of Steel. It was the DCEU's foundation, and when your foundation is weak, you'll find it difficult to build upon. But our own Colton Ogburn, who is the man who was trapped inside a television, but he doesn't know it, so please don't tell him, he liked Man of Steel, so we'll let him say a few words. Throughout my career, I've often been called a DCEU hater. And I'll admit that I haven't been fond of many of the DCEU's films and its rushed cinematic universe. But I'm not going to focus on the negatives today. Instead, I want to talk about my three favorite things the DCEU gave us. That includes Henry Cavill's Superman and Man of Steel, Ben Affleck's Batman portrayal, and the masterpiece that was The Flash. When I saw Man of Steel in theaters back in 2013, I was 16 years old, and at the time, I wasn't blown away by the movie. I didn't feel the hope and the joy that you feel watching the OG Superman films, but now as an adult looking back on Man of Steel, I've come to appreciate the film. I loved getting to see a take on Superman that showed Clark having no idea what his place in this world was. We got to see a young man trying to discover who he is. Not who he is as in what planet he's from or who his alien parents are, but who he wants to be as a person and what his responsibilities as a god amongst men should be. They used the Superman lore to tell a story about a young man trying to find his place in the world. A young man trying to do right by his father both of them, while simultaneously trying to be true to his own self. I thought Man of Steel was a brilliant depiction of what it means to grow up and become the person you want to be. A film about discovering your true self. A film about legacy, responsibility, and taking that first step into the great unknown. And how terrifying that can be for anyone even a Man of Steel. I also adored Ben Affleck's portrayal of Batman. He is the best on-screen Batman we've ever had. And then of course we have The Flash, a movie with themes of inner struggle, self-sacrifice, and fighting your own inner demons, which to me mirrored Man of Steel brilliantly. And we got Michael freaking Keaton back as Batman. 
Okay, Ben Affleck was a great Batman and the Flash movie was fine, but Man of Steel, I have my own personal story to say about Man of Steel, which I'll talk about a little later in the video. And now I believe Paul from Heavy Spoilers, who, by the way, voted in the Oscar poll 400 times for Flash Enters the Speed Force, he would like to say a few words. Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the Okay, stop, stop, stop. He's clearly just trying to demonetize the video, so we'll check back in with him in intervals of seven seconds or less. Wind. So following Man of Steel, Warner Brothers decided they want to stick with their dark tone, which was first made popular in Nolan's Batman trilogy. Only those movies were also still fun. And so came the push for a cinematic universe with Snyder's dark tone meant to contrast the bright and poppy nature of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They were so desperate to catch up with Marvel Studios and duplicate their success that they rushed into production on a Batman v Superman movie. A movie that if done right, should have and could have made a billion dollars. But instead, we got this. Save Martha! So for more on Batman v Superman, here's Dodson Sites to say a few words. If we're putting the DC Cinematic Universe to rest, then let me tell you where it all went wrong for me. Batman vs Superman. To start off, I'm not a traditional Superman fan. To me, he's too OP and unrelatable, right? Like, I just couldn't relate to being an alien from another dimension, burdened with godhood, who's living on a small farm in Kansas. That would just, I don't know, I just couldn't relate to it. But however, I could relate to being the trauma-induced goth kid who is an outsider to society, which is not only why I liked Batman so much as a kid growing up, but is also why I love Zack Snyder's Superman, right? He was an outcast, burdened with godhood, who, you know, just couldn't fit in in normal society, and he even showed remorse after killing his own kind, which in a way kind of humanized him. This was a dark Superman, right? For the first time, we really got this like definitely grittier take. And I'm like, okay, cool. This this Superman feels like it's complex. There's some elements to play with. And then when Batman versus Superman came out, I was super excited. I was like, okay, cool. So we're gonna have this dark Superman. Who is that? Who is that gonna contrast with? I guess you have to have like a a light. Batman, in a sense, right? And to me, that would mean like a Batman that's super beholden to the rules, right? Like definitely takes up the no killing rule to an extreme extent, right? He's burdened with this loss of like losing my favorite Robin, Jason Todd. And this light Batman could basically create a contingency plan against Superman after seeing the destruction of Zod and Man of Steel and knowing that the only one that was able to stop him was another Kryptonian, right? Seems like a glaring weakness for humankind. Instead, that's just not what we got. We kind of got a big pissing contest between these two like super dark, dark characters. Instead of having a light Batman, they just gave dark to dark, 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 dark Batman, who is darker than all the rest and dark, 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 dark. It just didn't, to me, it really clashed with the universe that they were creating. It just became a dark, grittier universe. And in a lot of ways, uh, that's what Zack Snyder's universe has been memed into. And it led to, in my opinion, one of the worst plot resolutions of all time. Save Martha! I remember audibly booing in the theater when that line came up. Like, my friends were like, hey, you need to chill out. You, you're, you're making a scene. You combine that with the fact that they set Bruce up to be the one who brings them all together. And I'm like, Batman? Like, the dude who has contingency plans on how to take out every single one of his co-workers? That's the guy who brings them all together? That, like, lone wolf that they're always trying to kind of, like, wrangle into the group in all of the Justice League episodes that I watched as a kid growing up? That guy? That's gonna be your Nick Fury? That's gonna be your Agent Coulson? A at that point, it, it felt less like a specific director's take on a character and more like they just didn't really know those characters at their heart. Thank you, Dodd. And to say a few more words about Batfleck, here's Matt Singer. Hello, everyone. I'm here today to pay tribute to someone I hold in great esteem. A friend to justice, an enemy of evil, and a man weirdly fixated on women named Martha. I speak, of course, of Ben Affleck's Batman. Granted, our friend Batfleck did not always appear in the best movies. Arguably, he never even appeared in a good movie. Unless you count the director's cut of Justice League, which is technically a streaming TV miniseries. But that doesn't mean that Ben Affleck wasn't good casting to play Batman. He was. He just maybe was not good casting to play Batman in the DC Extended Universe. He was a weird fit right off the bat. No pun intended. He was introduced in a black and white photograph, looking depressed, next to the giant armored tank he called a Batmobile. Before he'd shot a foot of film, he was already a meme. Sad Batman. 
But you know what? Playing a morose Batman is a totally viable choice. Batman is a guy who should be sad. His parents are dead. He's totally alone in the world. He gets zero credit for all of the times he saved Gotham City. He's in constant agony from all the physical abuse he puts his body through. He never gets to sleep for more than two or three hours at a time. Basically, being Batman sucks. Don't think so? Just ask Ben Affleck. All around me are familiar faces. So, if you're gonna make a movie about how being Batman sucks, Ben Affleck is a perfect choice to play that downtrodden, aging Bruce Wayne. You only need to see one picture from the paparazzi of Ben Affleck with his head down and iced Dunkin' coffee in his hand, shuffling through Beverly Hills like an over-caffeinated Charlie Brown to know this dude gets Batman's inner sadness. But here's the thing. Affleck never got to play sad Batman. Zack Snyder doesn't make movies about sad superheroes. He makes movies about angry ones. And Rage, that's never been Affleck's strong suit as an actor. So he was the right guy in the wrong movies. He was both perfectly cast and utterly miscast. He finally seemed to feel at home in that molded rubber bodysuit in The Flash, where he got to play the role of a world-weary, seen-it-all mentor. And that suited him. And then, in a literal flash, it was all over. He was replaced, like so many of us, by Michael Keaton and George Clooney. Fare thee well, Batfleck. You were far too ruggedly depressed for this ruined world. And of course, after Batman v Superman came Suicide Squad. What, we some kind of Suicide Squad? This was the DCEU's first attempt at a major tonal shift, trying to mimic the success of the MCU's Guardians of the Galaxy. Bevan, please say a few words about Suicide Squad. David Ayer's Suicide Squad was a beautiful drama that fell into a barrel of corporate toxic chemicals and came out worse than mad. It was bad. Though technically a box office success with earning over 700 million, the film was just puzzling to watch. It felt like a long extended trailer over a cohesive narrative, probably because it was actually cut by a movie trailer company. Why? Well, Warner Brothers was feeling anxious at the time. Marvel was at an all time high. Deadpool was doing so well. The Avengers were a major hit. Warner Brothers wanted a piece of that action, but instead of building up their heroes with solo outings, they fast tracked it by forcing Man of Steel 2 to have like more of a Justice League kind of prequel feel to it. And David Ayer's Suicide Squad was pushed out the door as fast as he could. He only was given six weeks to write a script while having to cast simultaneously at the same time. Did that hurt him at first? Actually, no. All accounts say that the initial shoot went really well. The cast even showed up at San Diego Comic-Con to show a teaser of what the film promised, which was more of a Batman dark, grittier kind of feel and tone to it. Then Batman vs. Superman came out and, uh, Critics did not like it. Fans did not like it. Did it still make money? Yeah, but nobody liked it. In a panic, Warner Brothers sent Suicide Squad back into extensive and expensive reshoots. They thought, oh, the issue is it's too dark. It's not funny enough. It's not like Deadpool. Let's make, let's make Suicide Squad like Deadpool. And David Ayer was just sitting there going, but that's not what I wanted. Ayer stated that his soulful drama was beaten into a comedy. I thought that the film was just a cohesive mess. It was totally uneven. I really didn't understand the casting of Jared Leto or even the choices that he was making. Now he came out and said a lot of his scenes were cut. David Ayer has come out and said that his vision for Joker wasn't what was presented on the screen. In fact, none of his vision is basically presented on the screen. Poor guy. I really wanted to like Suicide Squad and I left the theater going, wow, what a mess. Perhaps the air cut would have made more sense. There might still be a chance, dear viewer, for us to find out what that vision is. In a recent statement, Ayer came out on social media and said that he spoke to James Gunn about releasing the air cut since release the Snyder Cut was so popular and actually did end up happening. Gunn has actually stated that the film will have its time to be shared. Will it though? I don't know. I guess we'll have to see. Until then, 
stay evil, dollface. Thank you, Bevan. So, following the failures of Batman v Superman and Suicide Squad, the DCEU actually turned out a pretty good movie with Wonder Woman. Our post-production manager here at Screen Crush, Harriet Lingle Enright, would like to say a few words. Hello. My name is Harriet, and I've known Wonder Woman since World War I, and we were pretty close once upon a time. I confess that when I first saw her, I thought she was pretty much perfect, especially when she threw that truck. I went back to see it three times. Even now, the memory makes me smile through my tears. I'll never forget the two hours and 21 minutes that I spent with her, even if I wouldn't mind forgetting the last 30 or so minutes. Her banter with whatever Chris Pine's character's name was was witty and amusing and almost made me forget that the first major female superhero shared her entire runtime with a male co-star. Such a good thing that they knew when to cut off their relationship before it became tired or irritating. We'll never forget how she saved the world from all future wars after defeating Ares. We're so grateful to have peace on Earth forever after what she did, and with such a thematically satisfying conclusion. Would that we all had the chance for our problems to be turned into David Thewlis, who we could punch in the face until the problem was solved. It's such a tragedy that she was taken from us before she ever had the chance to make a sequel. Every day I wake up and I wish I could have seen her in a nostalgia bait 80s movie with two badly written villains. I'm sorry, what was that? Thank you. Wonder Woman, for the time that you spent with us and the ways that you made the world a better place. And thank you, most of all, for throwing that truck. Same old song. Thank you, Harriet. Now, following the glimmer of hope that Wonder Woman gave the DCEU and its fans, that light was quickly squashed by this. Ah! Justice League was an absolute cluster. Studio execs were unhappy with the direction Snyder was taking their franchise. Snyder's daughter very tragically took her own life during the production as well. So this all led to Snyder stepping down and the studio brought in Joss Whedon to completely overhaul the film, from the color grading, the comedic tone, and even the story. The Justice League film felt like a terrible mishmash of conflicting creative directions that made the film feel like a convoluted mess, which I guess is poetic because what is the DCEU if not a convoluted mess with jarring tonal shifts, messy dialogue, and story being pulled in every direction but the right one. Following the flaming bag of shit that film was, we saw the DCEU completely abandon the Snyder tone. And then came a pretty decent Aquaman film. So I'd like to bring on our friend Patrick H. Willems to say a few words about the fish man. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Sorry, I just uh, got here from a wedding, and now this is a funeral, and I feel like I'm not dressed appropriately, but, but whatever. Um, we are here today to eulogize the DC Extended Universe, which is you know, not even its official name given by the studio, but it's what we all decided to call it at, at, at some point because we had nothing else that was better. Um, and look, the DCEU and I, we've always had a complicated relationship. Uh, we've never seen eye to eye, but we had our moments. And one of those moments was a film that I like to call because it's its actual title, Aquaman. A movie made by one Mr. James Wan, a brilliant filmmaker uh, who made the masterpiece that is Furious 7, as well as creating a far more successful cinematic universe than DC's, The Conjuring one. James Wan was one of these guys, kind of like, you know, Patty Jenkins with Wonder Woman, who, who came in to basically take one of the characters that had been introduced by Zack Snyder and then give them a solo movie. Jason Momoa's Aquaman was introduced as like a really like tough, badass, like, Conan the Barbarian as Aquaman, like not your daddy's Aquaman, and uh, James Wan didn't quite do that. See, what James Wan understood, which, you know, very few filmmakers in this era of too many superhero movies understand, is that superheroes are inherently a little bit silly. Most other filmmakers are embarrassed of that, and they try to steer in the like total opposite direction, but James Wan embraced that. James Wan made a movie where Aquaman is just like the coolest party dude in the world, and he goes to an undersea kingdom that looks like a Lisa Frank notebook. A world where octopuses play drums. A world where Patrick Wilson gives like a Shakespearean level, totally committed performance as Orm the Ocean Master. A performance that would make Laurence Olivier go, nice. 
a thing that Olivier was known for saying. This is a movie that has everything. It's a movie that has more movie in it than like a year's worth of movies. It's a movie where when you're like two hours in and you're like, man, I've seen everything already. I, I feel like this cost like a trillion dollars. I can't imagine what else they could fit in this. Then a Kraken voiced by Julie Andrews shows up and then you meet the Brine Kingdom, a kingdom of crab people led by the Brine King, played by John Rhys Davies, where they have a bunch of giant lava crabs that then fight in a war against Patrick Wilson as Orm the Ocean Master, who's riding on a shark. And look, I could go on forever, but I love Aquaman. It's just a very silly cartoon of a movie that has so much energy, has an actual visual style, is fun, understands that it's goofy and silly and it embraces that. Willem Dafoe is there. He teaches Aquaman how to fight with a trident. It's a good time. Anyway, I haven't even really read the speech that I wrote, but that doesn't matter. I just want to say that as the years go on, when I look back on this tumultuous time of the DCEU, I'm always going to smile when I think of Aquaman. My man. Yeah. All right. Just a drop of water in an endless sea. Thank you, Patrick. Now, Aquaman felt inconsistent and distant from the DCEU that came before, and the same can be said for Shazam. So now I'd like to bring on a friend of the show, Adam Lance Garcia, to discuss Captain Marvel himself, Shazam. The Shazam films weren't perfect. That sounds like a damning way to start a eulogy, but it's an honest one. They hug the line between classic all-age superhero stories, coming-of-age films, and often straight horrors. Never truly finding the right balance, but always trying and doing so with the beating heart of a found family at their center. In that way, they were the true spirit of the original Captain Marvel Shazam comics, adventures that would occasionally veer to the childish before dovetailing too far into mature themes than were appropriate for the target audience. I loved these films, and despite their flaws, they were often charming, filled with kindness and love, and again, a lot of heart. And if they failed, you knew David Sandberg and the cast had at least tried something risky then rather than play it safe. But more than anything, these films have a personal place in my heart, more so than any other film series can ever match. My father was a huge Captain Marvel fan, collecting the comics from childhood until he passed away. He loved the idea of a superhero who was at their heart still a child. I think he found an innocence and a kind of hope in the character that mirrored his own ideals. He would dream of shouting Sajam and dream of flying even into his 70s. He loved the original serials and would wax poetic that he would never live to see Shazam turn to a major motion picture like Superman or Batman or Spider-Man or who, whomever. But not only did he get the chance to see his favorite superhero on the screen, he, through my career as an entertainment journalist, got the chance to meet the cast and the kindness they showed him in those brief moments not only exemplified the spirit of Shazam, it remains one of the few good memories I have of my father's last days. To the filmmakers, the stars, and the creators of Shazam, I can only say thank you for giving me and my father a last good memory. Something that I don't think I'll ever ever lose. The kindness that was shown to him and the kindness that was shown to me exemplifies everything about Shazam, exemplifies everything about those heroes. And while those films were not perfect, and while I can point out every single one of their flaws, all I ever see when I see Shazam in Fury of the Gods is how happy it made my dad and how happy it made me. I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna miss those films, I'm gonna miss that feeling, but I'll always have those movies because I'll always have my dad that way. 
Adam, that was deeply personal and moving, and thank you for sharing. But I must yet again honor the tonal shift of the DCU by kicking it up a notch and continuing with the theme of DCU titles that pretty much ignored the confines of their cinematic universe to just have some fun. Let's bring on our own Brianna McLarty to talk about Birds of Prey and the fabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. It's such a sad day today. There have been so many losses, so many great soldiers have fallen, but I'm here today to talk about Birds of Prey. It may not have been the best DCEU movie I ever saw, but it was the wildest. How do you even describe Birds of Prey? It's like Barbie if Barbie was made for insane people. And I love that about it. From the moment Harley cut her hair and burst into tears, I knew this would be a movie for me. It's filled with iconic and batshit crazy moments. How could you forget when Harley uses a block of cocaine as a baseball to knock out the bad guys? Or when Roman Sionis cuts a girl's face off because she had a snot bubble? Or perhaps most iconic of all, when Harley does a shoe change in the middle of a fight so she can put on roller skates. When the f*** does she have time to do a shoe change? But there was more to this movie than iconic moments. There was also amazing fashion. Everybody in this movie is serving the entire film. Harley's outfit's amazing. Huntress's costume, great. Roman is not only fashionable, but Ewan McGregor is putting everything into his performance. He's silly, he's scary, he's melodramatic, and most of all, he's fabulous. And we couldn't talk about Birds of Prey without talking about the fight scenes. Glitter, pink, blue, music by Halsey, Harley doing flips at random, Huntress smiling as she takes down seven ninjas, Detective Montoya drunk at the final fight, and a beautiful moment when Harley gives Dinah a hair tie in the middle of combat, proving once and for all that she truly is a girl's girl. Was the movie realistic? No. Was it linear? Nope. Did the title make sense? Not really. But was it fun? Was it pretty? Was it camp? Absolutely. And sometimes that's all you need. R.I.P. Birds of Prey. You were truly before your time. The TikTok film girls would have loved you. Thank you, Brianna. And continuing on that sentiment, I'd also like to have a friend of the show, Heather Antos, come up to say a few words on the evolution of the DCEU's greatest character. Ladies, gents, and fellow Coney Island mischief makers, today we gather not with tears, but with a smirk as we bid adieu to the one and only Harley Quinn as portrayed by Margot Robbie, a character who's had a more dramatic cinematic makeover than Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool. We're here to chuckle, reminisce, and raise a toast to Harley's evolution. From her live action debut in David Ayer's Suicide Squad, where she she was unfortunately burdened with outdated and problematic stereotypes, to the triumphant Birds of Prey, where her arc came full circle as a symbol of empowerment and resilience, and where she, quite frankly, kicked a lot of butt. Now, let's not kid ourselves. Harley's debut in Suicide Squad was a bit like finding out your favorite pizza joint only serves pineapple pizza. Disappointing and a bit confusing. She was stuck in a portrayal that had more eye candy than a candy store and seemed entangled in a web of misogyny, zero autonomy, children's clothing, and it all completely overshadowed her complexity as a character. But as Harley said herself, if you want boys to respect you, you have to show them that you're serious. Enter Birds of Prey, where Harley Quint went from being the sidekick to the Joker's clown to the leading lady of her own circus. The movie's feminist approach wasn't just a step forward, it was a giant leap in character development, very appropriately showcasing a woman learning to stand on her own and walk away from the toxic men in her life, and pissing off quite a few toxic men in the real world who weren't ready to accept that their maniacal pixie dream Harley Quinn was no longer being catered for them. Harley wasn't waiting around for Mr. J to put on a ring on it. She was busy putting the smack down on anyone who dared mess with her. No longer tethered to the Joker, she was a force to be reckoned with, complete with a baseball bat and sarcastic quip for every occasion, and quite frankly, far more practical shoes. And while Kathy Yan's Birds of Prey wasn't perfect, it was a huge movement towards just feminist portrayals of women having autonomy and superhero movies. Then enter James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, where her arc came full circle. This clown princess is no longer looking for a savior, and she's no longer anyone's victim. So as we bid farewell to the cinematic roller coaster that is the DCEU and Harley Quinn, let's do it with a wink, a nod, and a promise to carry her lessons with us. Here's to you, Harley. You are your own pudding now. May you maintain your autonomy and identity in the future films to come. Slow away.
And just before my eyes a curiosity. It was during COVID that we got the long-awaited Snyder Cut of the Justice League. WB had officially abandoned its plans for the DCEU and seemed to not really have any plans set in stone. And with the movie world still being at a standstill during the pandemic, it made sense to just finish and release the damn thing to juice up their new streaming service. And now, here to say a few words about the slightly better Justice League movie, we have Charlie from Emergency Awesome. This is Charlie from Emergency Awesome saying my goodbye to the DCEU eulogizing Zack Snyder's Justice League trilogy, which we only got to see part of on screen in the Snyder Cut, which was sort of the culmination of his work in the DC Universe. We only got a chance to see the Justice League sequels in a series of concept art and story breakdown boards hand drawn by Jim Lee himself and Zack Snyder. If you haven't read those, there were a couple questionable moments with the way they ended Justice League 3, so maybe it's a plus that we didn't see that original ending, or maybe he would have changed that had he gotten to actually make it. But I do think had we got the chance to actually see those original Justice League movies that he planned, it would have turned around a lot of the complaints people had against films, say, like Batman v Superman. Most importantly, it would have refocused the DC Universe on Henry Cavill's Superman, who seemingly got shafted the most of all the A-list Justice League actors. So uh, there's a lot to be thankful for, and I'll get to that in time. But I want to thank you guys most of all. Thank you for your support, and thank you for your patience. I mean, how can you not give your starring quarterback a proper sequel movie of his own? That's basically what the rest of the Justice League trilogy would have been, essentially a very large Superman movie with the rest of the Justice League characters in it. But as it stands, I'm still glad that we got a chance to see the Justice League Snyder Cut, which he put so much energy into trying and redeem the awful, awful Whedon Cut and everything bad that happened just surrounding that entire event. So everyone, please pour one out for the DCEU, press F to pay respects for that Justice League trilogy in the Henry Cavill sequels that we will not get to see. Thank you, Charlie. Now our lead editor, Randolph Nombrado, would like to say some words himself about a Justice League member who never really got the spotlight he deserved. Randolph, take it away. The DCEU character that I'd like to lay to rest today is unfortunately, Cyborg. <laughs> I think one of the best parts of the Snyder Cut is the addition of Cyborg's origin story, and it is such a shame we have to say goodbye. Not only to the character, but to so much of what Snyder put into the character to make him better than whatever we got in Justice League. Right ain't over yet. <laughs> My man. In just two added scenes, we learn about his tragic backstory and his motives. Something that the Justice League for some reason decided to omit. Now, in, in that cut, we don't really know why he wants to be part of the Justice League. The plot just needs him to be there. You can find the boxes. You share their energy. But his origin story in the Snyder Cut makes him an incredibly nuanced character, which is fair to say that's really hard to come by in this franchise. Take for instance the beautiful sequence of him stepping into the virtual world, where he learns about his power. It's an entire nuclear arsenal you could launch with a thought. After learning he can basically do anything he wants, he decides to help a struggling mother. Because, like his mom said, Victor helped her because he's got a good heart. And I thought this was a really clever way of showing his humanity after his mother, his freedom, and his life had been stripped away from him. Then maybe you already know I need your help. The world does. F the world. Also, he has this complicated relationship with his father, who he blames for the death of his mother. If you were there, mom would still be alive. And superhero with daddy issues. I mean, come on. What's with all the daddy issues? We got Tony Stark, daddy issues. Jen. Thor, daddy issues. Now this is important because later in the movie, his father dies right in front of him and he never gets to mend his relationship with him. It isn't edgy just for the sake of being edgy. It gives him a reason to be in the film and to do something, aside from just being able to communicate with the mother boxes. Let's go find the son of a bitch. His character arc beautifully comes to a close at the end of the movie when the three mother boxes try to trick him as his parents and his human self. My broken boy. He reconciles with his past and comes to terms with who he is. I'm not broken. Just awesome. And that's what I'm gonna miss so much about this character. He was nuanced, his character arc was so compelling and made sense in the context of the film. He will be missed. R.I.P. Cyborg. Oh, it should have been me! It should have been me! And guys, then James Gunn's The Suicide Squad injected new life into the DCEU, and man, this film is amazing. It's your mom! Ah, oh, this film is so gold. I mean, of course it is. It's James Gunn. And it was this movie that showed WB that they might have finally found their shepherd, their own Kevin Feige. Gunn delivered not only an awesome Suicide Squad movie, but he also gave the DCEU their first TV series in Peacemaker. Oh, Eagle is no ordinary eagle. No. Eagly. Take it. 
That show is amazing. Anyways, both Suicide Squad films made a lasting impression on the fan community, and I would like to bring on Nando from Nando V Movies to say a few words about a fantastic character who was introduced in this franchise. Hi, DCEO. It's me, Nando from Nando V Movies, and I want to talk about one specific character that I think you guys got really right. There are a lot of characters that I've always been a big fan of, but I never expected to see in live action. However, in 2016's Suicide Squad, the first one, and the inexplicably third movie in the DCEU, we got a surprisingly silly live action version of Captain Boomerang. Digger Harkness is one of the weirdest villains that has managed to maintain a relatively high profile for a long time. His gimmick is that he throws boomerangs. He does not have superpowers, he's just pretty good at throwing them, and he owns a bunch of explosive boomerangs. What most people probably know him from is being a member of the Suicide Squad, especially recently with a lot of the comics, the cartoons, and now the games. Your standard Suicide Squad tends to be something like we're getting in the new game, Deadshot, Harley Quinn, some sort of big guy, sometimes Killer Croc, but usually King Shark, and then, inexplicably, Captain Boomerang. But I gotta say, Jai Courtney's take on Captain Boomerang is equal parts gross, pointless, and kind of fun. Like, they kind of got the spirit of this character right in a way that I don't think they always did with some of these guys. But I do think there was somebody who had a vision for what a Captain Boomerang in this grimy, somewhat realistic DCEU would look like, and they did not hold back one bit. And I love that James Gunn brought Captain Boomerang back, gave him an even better costume, and a Suicide Squad appropriate death very early in the movie to set some stakes. There are a lot of things the DCU did that I do not agree with, but one thing, looking back, that I cannot deny is I had a pretty good time with their version of Captain Boomerang. Tragically, the Suicide Squad was just released a little bit too late. Fan apathy had taken over the DCEU due to multiple tonal shifts, the lack of direction in the early films, the release of the Snyder Cut, and subsequent films that just felt disconnected. Then there commenced a power struggle between fans who wanted the Snyderverse restored, the Rocks version for the DCEU that he tried to realize through Black Adam, but then James Gunn was made head of the DC Universe and he announced that they were going to reboot the whole damn thing. New sequels this year were dead on arrival, especially The Flash. So now I'd like to ask Real Rejects to say some words. Hello, my name is Greg Alba. And I'm John Humphrey. And I want to thank you all for being here with us as we say goodbye to the greatest franchise that has ever existed, the DCEU. And while this franchise has been something that has meant the world to us in, in every possible way and has been a steady flow throughout our entire existence here on this earth, mm. there's one person in particular who we feel obliged to say a very specific goodbye to one who we will just absolutely never forget ever one whose career you could say seems like it went by in a flash mm -hmm. absolutely you know what I mean? absolutely and hey you know it's not always been the smoothest ride but we've been there for you we've right? been there for you just like you've been there for us despite all the legal troubles mm -hmm. you've been into problematic situations the in amount, the press the amount of people questioning should you have just been fired should mm -hmm. you have been replaced constant mm -hmm. up and downs of watching you just your red speed on by exactly. well i mean obviously we are here to say goodbye to none other than queen mara yes if anyone deserves their flowers, it is Queen Mary. It's Queen Mary. You know, just thinking about how the last installment of the DCU is going to be Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Looking at the promotional footage for it and seeing just how you're not even featured in there. And I, I just thought, it's okay, like Warner Brothers knows what they're doing. It's a sign of respect. Because sometimes we have to do what's right, even if our hearts ache against it. And doing what's right is making sure they preserve the quality time we have with you just reserved for the people when they're in the audience. They already know that we're coming to see you. We don't already. care about anything else. They got to work to advertise the rest of the movie, but you are our queen and the, we're going to be at your altar. There's a reason you're trending all the time and it's because nothing is divisive about you. It is just over. You are the Taylor Swift of the uh, uh, of the DCEU. Let's face it. Yeah. Sure. This is your DC era. Honestly, I could say goodbye to everything else and not care, but Mara? No. Release the mirror cut of the entire universe. There's so many adventures we will never get to have, and it's not fair, but we got one more, and I'm going to cherish that for the rest of the year. Think about all the missed potential we could have had. Badass!
My man. <laughs> now we're approaching the end of today's service, but before I let you go, Doug and I want to give you our closing thoughts. Doug, go right ahead. Yeah, you know, I thought Superman was like totally justified in letting his dad die to save that dog. Oh, is that it? Yeah, I'm done. Oh, okay. Well, speaking of Man of Steel, I was so excited to see that movie. I mean, Superman is my favorite hero. The guy could do anything in the world, and yet he only chooses to help. And the opening with Krypton and Michael Shannon. I will find him! It was all just spectacular. But as the movie wore on, I could see Zack Snyder overindulging his worst tendencies that actually made his Watchmen adaptation a failure. Somewhere around the time he let his dad die, I realized, oh, this movie thinks it's smart, but it's actually really stupid. And then when Superman snapped Zod's neck, it broke my heart. Superman, the ultimate optimist, had been taken over by the cynics. Well, yeah, but you know, he... Look, I don't want to get into the whole debate about Superman killing. Yes, Superman in the comics did execute Kryptonians according to Kryptonian law, but then afterwards, he exiled himself from Earth for like an entire year. Zack Snyder just wanted Superman to kill, and there were never any repercussions for that. I mean, and after the movie, I was screaming in the parking lot at the top of my lungs, Superman doesn't kill! It's both the most ashamed of myself and the proudest of myself I've ever been. But the final movie of the DCEU, Blue Beetle, was a ray of hope. It was funny, inventive, and showed a level of wit and sophistication that Snyder's films just never possessed. Wait, I thought Aquaman 2 was the last DCEU movie. Oh, you know what? Uh, I didn't see it. I'll probably catch it on Max. Well, guys, thank you for attending this funeral. Let me know your thoughts on the DCEU down in the comments below, and let me know uh, which segment you thought was the best. Was it mine? Let us know down below, or you can add any of us on our socials. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Dust in the wind All we are is dust in the wind